a, a great introduction to what's going to happen now as we get a chance to hear from some folks who are going to tell us about ways in which they have uh, shown a little love and kindness, made a little part of the world a happier place. Uh, Phil Pacey is going to introduce our guests. Uh, I am a member of the Outreach Committee and I'm also a member of the Mini Hands Mission Team and um, today we're going to take the opportunity just to discuss some things. Um, I have four people who are going to, who have been on trips and they're going to uh, take the time to present their thoughts and about their trips. Um, Kathy Reed, Richard Harrington, Ken Orford and Doris Thomas are going to talk about their trips. So enjoy. Good morning. I've been asked to talk to you this morning about my experience as part of the Honduras 2008 Mini Hands Mission Team. As I thought about what I was going to say, I realized that being part of that team was only a small part of a long list of mission work that individuals like you and I can accomplish. Let me talk about being part of a mission team. This would be a group of two or more people that have a goal of improving life or circumstances for another person or group without any expectation of payment or reward. We have many such teams here at Eastminster. Many of you belong to groups that use their time and their talents to do volunteer work. In your office settings, Perhaps you got together to sponsor a needy family with a Christmas sharing basket or to raise funds for adopt a child. Perhaps it is volunteering at the Open Door Cafe to provide a meal and a smile of encouragement for those of our community that need the nourishment or the companionship. Perhaps it is being an elder or an officer of the church. Being part of a group of individuals with a common goal of helping others is doing mission work. We do these things without any expectation of payment or reward. Our payment comes from within, with a sense of satisfaction in knowing that we have done something to make life easier or more comfortable for others. A realization that life is bigger than we are as an individual. There's more to life than me. That being said, going to Honduras was truly an experience of a lifetime. Traveling to another place and being in unfamiliar surroundings with a, and a different culture with a group of individuals, most of whom I did not know personally, was a little intimidating. However, working together at the boys' orphanage, eating together as a group, spending time together in prayer and meditation helped to quickly bond us as a team. The experiences that we shared and the knowledge that we gained, the laughter and the smiles from the children that we played with, and the gratitude from the adults that we dealt with will be a bright memory for me always. The realization that there's many things that we take for granted that people in other parts of the world strive for. A full, a, a full stomach, a place to sleep that's safe. I learned there that I am able to do things that I would never have thought possible. I can be part of a construction team, perhaps not doing the heavy lifting, but I can cut rebar. I didn't even know what that was before. I can mix, I can mix cement with a shovel. And I was part of a team. Being part of a team means you don't need to do it all yourself. You can count on others to share the load. The load doesn't always have to be a physical load either. It can be an intellectual load that you are asked to carry. So it doesn't matter what your age or your physical condition. Sharing experiences from your past and personal knowledge is invaluable to others on your team. The wisdom of the elders, as well as the enthusiasm of the youth, are necessary components of many group dynamics. So whether you are able to join a team that will travel to a distant place or join a team that will work locally, being part of a group with a mission and spending time in prayer together 
Working toward a common goal is rewarding from within, and I can highly recommend it. Thank you. Good morning. I'm here with you this morning to talk about the Many Hands medical mission team that went to Guatemala in 2009. Our team consisted of one doctor, two nurses, and a nurse practitioner. This was my second venture into mission trips. My first trip was to Sierra Leone, Africa in 2005. From that first mission trip, a group of individuals formed what is now the Many Hands Mission Team. They have gone or sent people on several missions since then. Back to Guatemala. Before we left, we collected and purchased many pieces of medical equipment and supplies, including much needed drugs. Our suitcases, or hockey bags, were packed with our own clothes as well as this medical equipment to a maximum of 50 pounds, with each of us allowed two of these bags to take on the plane. That's 1,800 pounds of mostly medical equipment and supplies. When we arrived in Guatemala, we were very fortunate that Mary Lynn Miles could speak Spanish, for I'm sure if the customs agent would have confiscated all our bags, especially the drugs, if she had not been able to explain why we were there. We got through it and proceeded to our mission house for the night. Las Perens was our destination, a four-hour ride in an old Volkswagen minibus up into the mountains of Guatemala. One of the awe moments, which I will explain to you later, we were put up in a mission house with bunk beds and supplied sleeping bags and settled in. We initially started to do home visits, but it was decided that it wasn't the best use of the doctors and the nurses and the five support staff that were with them. Our host from Mission Ventures then set up a series of clinics. Each day we would travel to a different community where we would register the people and we would set up uh, privacy areas inside for the doctors and nurses and pharmacy. These clinics were very successful. Waiting lines were formed very early in the morning before we arrived and we would not usually leave till after dark after everyone had been seen. So supper was always well into the evening. Unlike Africa, Guatemala seemed to me a little bit better off. Whereas in Sierra Leone, where people were, where so many people were starving and victims of civil war and polio, scrounging for food on a daily basis just to survive, the people here seemed looked after, were looked after as far as food was concerned. Everyone farmed. Every piece of land, hillsides, ravines, every square inch would be farmed. Potatoes, corn, cabbage, etc. Unfortunately, their misfortune was that meat, milk, fruit were not readily available or were too expensive to purchase. So their diet was lacking in protein and dairy products. Government services were not available as well as doctors or medical services. Babies were fed Coca-Cola instead of milk because it was so cheap, resulting in most teens having lost their teeth, having fillings and caps put on them. Since most of the women also worked in the fields and had carried their babies on their back, one of the many complaints from them was sore backs and tired legs. Dr. Mandeville was very patient with these people and supplied lots of vitamins for these. Our team worked very well together and was very successful. Each day after work, Kay Summers, who was our resident grandmother, would recap the day, telling us her awe moment, the oddest things she saw, most interesting, someone or something she wanted to remember and something she would like to forget. We all got on board and started sharing these on a daily basis. It became an important part of our trip, defining the real reason why we were there. When I think back about the trip, like I did on Friday when I was writing this, I think about the people we shared our knowledge with, our medical help we gave, 
the people we gave reading glasses to, the children we played with, the fingernails I painted on children and grandmothers, and how important our team was to each other. I believe if only for a moment we help someone medically, help someone feel important about themselves, and maybe made a difference in their lives. Back to that awe moment traveling in that minibus. It's a beautiful country. Around every bend there was lush forests and, and land being worked by the farmers. It was really God's work at its best. Traveling in the minibus was a little different story. It was a different kind of awe moment, traveling narrow roads with no guardrails and fallen rock. It was kind of an awe moment to hang on to. Thank you. Good morning, folks. Uh, I will not go into, into depth on this, but it was a wonderful experience for me to go to Peru, Lima. The work we did was building construction of two separate churches. Uh, had the people were just beautiful. I call them beautiful people. They they are. They were so kind to us, our hosts. The our chief lead pastor provided us with meals in his home. We ate almost all our meals in his private dwelling, and it was almost like eating at home, surprisingly so. The people are dark complexioned and uh, a little shorter than our Canadian people, but they were excellent workers. And uh, I, so I'll say a couple of things that I considered to be outstanding. One is that we participated in a mission of their own. Approximately once a month, the, the religious community got together, loaded up with goodies, food, and went out to address what they termed the lost children of Lima, who lived in under bridges and anywhere else that they could find, and these people knew how to, how to find them, and uh, they normally held a little religious service, and we were entertained by some of these lost children. The lost being that the, the, the um, police had literally given up on them. They, they could never catch them because they were smarter than the police. Um, we were privy to watch the gathering of 5,000 teenage people from around the country and surrounding countries who were gathered together from all over Peru and in the surrounding countries. And this just amazed me. They, we watched their accommodation, not, not an accommodation, they were living, put up in an army base within Peru. And uh, they prof performed on a stage and they listened to religious guidance and the primary purpose as I understood it was to encourage leadership of their own within their own community in the religious aspect. I uh, would really encourage anyone, and I mean anyone, to go on a trip like that and you work, we worked hard, but uh, Age was not a factor. I was 80 years old when I went and I worked with the concrete alongside some, well, three lovely sisters who also <laughs> so, so worked beside us. And uh, it, was, it was a wonderful experience altogether. And I encourage anybody that has the opportunity to go on one of these in particular. I'd like to go back to Peru, but not but getting past the time where I'll work that hard again. I had the opportunity to go to uh, Peru as well. I went with um, 
Ken the first time, and the, and the second time I went to Peru, I went up the jungle, up into the jungle uh, on Bakumanu River to a small community of about 100 people. And the ad that the missionaries uh, responded to was, Dear God, please answer my prayer. Bokumanu, primitive, a very small port community located at the month, mouth of the Manu River. We pray for a small room to teach Sunday school and help tribal people when they come down river. Amen. Our team of 10 was the answer to that missionary's prayer. There's a certain tranquility to a place where people walk through jungle paths over hanging bridges from one community to the next. A place where you feel the urge to talk quietly so you can absorb the songs from the birds, to breathe the air so deeply that it goes into your lungs, goes deep into your lungs. No roads, no vehicles, a place so unblemished that has been referred to the lungs of the earth in reverse. Some might compare it to the Garden of Eden. Fruit was there for the picking. When you're in an area like that and you plan an activity, which we had planned, we had taken some dolls from our church and we, we had suggested that perhaps the women of Balcomanu might like to um, stuff the dolls and, and uh, make the arms and legs on them. And we had suggested that maybe seven o'clock might be a starting time. And we forgot that most people, um, a different culture has different timelines, and mo but most of these people did not have clocks or mirrors, as a matter of fact. But um, so pe some people started to arrive at 6.30 and others arrived at a quarter to eight. So in the end, we ended up, instead of with six people, as we anticipated might, anticipated might have been a good uh, number, we ended up with 18 women and 25 children. Some of the babies were asleep in their mother's arms. This isn't very conducive to working in a craft group. So several women from our group, uh, they held the sleeping babies for the evening. Other women in our group uh, played with the children, the older children, doing games that these children had never played before. Um, skipping ropes was, were very popular. That was their first time for having skipping ropes then. Um, the mothers knew that their children were nearby and safe and happy. And the women were creative. They, um, they sewed pockets on these little dolls and, and just, just really made them very nicely. At the end of the group, we served these women uh, um, tea and cookies. And we've been told that uh, most of women do not drink tea in, in this particular area. In spite of it, a number of them had two cups of tea and several cookies. And at the end of it, not only did the women um, really give us hugs to all of the two of us who ran this group. They hugged everybody who had looked after their children. Mucho gracias, mucho gracias. I mean, they really, really appreciated what we had uh, done for them. I just think the opportunity to have some me time was so important. It wasn't a part of something that they had had in the past. And this, for me, was such a wow moment. The final evening, Thomas, the pastor, and his wife, Norma, told us, that uh, they'd been praying for a week. How could they thank us for what we had done? Uh, that we had built the building for them, that we had spent time with the people, we had been with their children. And they said, finally, they had an answer to their prayer. And what they did, they poured out water into a basin and went around our group of 10 and washed our feet. No gift could have been more powerful. And even though I'd been home for nearly a year, preparing for today was like reliving that experience. These are the experiences you don't find in all-inclusive resorts or cruises. Would I go again? Yes, in a heartbeat. I want to thank the uh, four speakers. It was, uh, it was great. Um, uh, many hands missions, uh, we are always and every year doing mission trips. And um, it's just an opportunity for people to experience what these people have done. Our next trip is uh, this year is to Guatemala again. Uh, we're going up into the mountains even farther to build a resource center and to work uh, with the children. Um, I want to thank everybody here that supported us by tin cans, uh, going to our yard sale or giving us items. It's, it's very important. And um, 
for you, um, we have prepared a luncheon downstairs. Um, we have some stew and some freshly bread, made bread. I made it all night for you. And um, come down and join us. These people have lots of exciting things that they could tell you. Everybody has an awe moment. I've been on three trips myself, and I can remember them all. Um, we have books downstairs, and Doris can show you the boat that she went 15 hours in up the river. It's unbelievable. And uh, we have display boards, and we have some products that uh, we have purchased that if you'd like to take a look at. Uh, so please join us. Um, it'll be a great time of fellowship. Thank you.